All right, so we have some quite incredible news. Team Sky have released a lot of data about Chris Froome and his victory in the Giro d'Italia. So they go through diet, they go through his power output, they go through sort of like communications, logistics. It's, it's really good. I'm actually so happy to see this. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do this before, and I think the whole cycling community is like, well, what is going on? Anyway, so this is all just saying who's commenting. So we have the plan here, uh, which is basically how Chris Froome is going to lose weight during the Giro. And this is a very rogue practice because you genuinely think you want to maintain weight. And in the Tour de France, he actually gained weight uh, in the 2017 uh, Tour de France. After he lost the yellow jersey, he realized he wasn't eating enough. So he just kept eating more and gained a little bit of weight, uh, which is probably good uh, because obviously you don't want to get ill or anything. But anyway, so we'll just go on um, this two week plan here. Uh, and you'll be able to see. So we've got at the beginning day of Brailsford's rough plan, um, but we'll have it written up here. So you can see we have block one, absorb the work, recover well within, between stages, careful weight management. So these sprint stages, they're really like quite easy for Chris Froome. To be honest, they're not too stressful. So you can see here for the Montezon clan, his target weight was about 69 kilos. Um, and then he basically was trying to lose, you know, half a kilo um, before the summit finish on the uh, Incestriere. Um, this is the Colle de la Finestra, stage 19, 68 and a half. So you can see that he's basically optimized the day to recovery for the for individual TT and getting ready for the last training block, last block. So, you know, it's pretty interesting him trying to lose weight. Um, if we go into this, he's just trying to figure out how many, um, how much like restriction he's gonna do each day. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff, trying to lose weight during the Grand Tour. Um, very hard to do, I believe, or, and also recover. So anyway, now we go into his fueling, which is, again, very interesting. Uh, Chris Room obviously isn't vegan or anything, but he does eat a pretty high-carb diet, and you can see um, he doesn't eat much food, though. Uh, he's pretty good at restricting, uh, which is sort of what all these guys do, to be honest, at the top. I don't think any of them really, like, but all of them restrict, yeah. They all restrict their calories because that's how they can get lean easily. Um, so, yeah. So you can see this is uh, a stage 11. So, you know, it's a hilly stage, but nothing crazy. So his morning weight was 69 kilos. And after the stage, he lost about two kilos or so for water. So more or less, you drink one and a half times the amount of weight you lose. So he probably would have to drink about three and a half liters after that to regain his water. So you can see in the morning for breakfast, he had three eggs, I believe, and maybe some rice. Uh, so it's 78 grams of carbs, 28 grams of pro uh, protein, 11 grams of fat. So, you know, that's a classic, classic pro cyclist uh, breakfast, to be honest. They like, they like the protein, a uh, bit of carbs, but not that much. And then not a crazy amount of fat, but not like low fat, really. Um, Chris Froome said he eats a decently low fat diet, but I'm, it depends what your definition is. Anyway, on the bike, four hours, he had three waters, which isn't actually very many if you think about it. Um, he then had three gels, um, two caffeine gels, and five plain rice cakes. So that's 230 grams of carbs, um, five grams of protein, five grams of fat. So 981 calories, um, which, you know, to be honest, for four hours, he burnt 3,700 calories. So you can see that a lot of his fueling, um, he basically would have been using a lot of fat for this instead of the carbs because it was an easy stage. Therefore, he did not. So it could also include a PP in the first bottle. Potentially that's a mixed drink, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyway, again, interesting. Recovery um, was, again, 50 grams of rice. It's not much. Um, <laughs> or no, he could uh, increase the rice take to at least 70 grams. But anyway, again, 50 grams of carbs, 70 grams of protein. So again, pretty high protein, low carb, really um, classic cyclists. They do love their, do love restricting. Uh, you really do need the protein though if you are gonna restrict because a lot of your carbohydrates actually come from the amino acids. They break down the amino acids and turn that into the glycogen that you need or the sugar. I'm not excited, exactly 100% sure how it works, but that is a process that does happen in the body. So you need the protein to then replace that. That's why if you see a lot of people who eat low carb need high protein because otherwise their muscles would all be shrinking away. I believe Nigel Mitchell was talking about that when he was doing fat versus sugar, which was an interesting documentary on the BBC. Um, and then for dinner, he would normally uh, suggest more carbohydrate, um, but yesterday that he felt it was too much food. Again, 50 grams of carbs, 36 grams of protein, 12 grams of fat. So we can go over the summary of the day, and you can see that he did not eat um, a crazy amount, 400 grams of carbs. So that for him, that's you know maybe 
5.8 grams uh, per kilo, so not mental. Two grams, that's like a classic. That's actually a classic protein. And then fat, again, not, not too much fat, to be fair, actually. This is a pretty much perfect day of hitting all the targets in terms of moderate carbohydrate intake, high protein, low fat, low fiber. Um, fueling was not an issue. Uh, and you can see here on the bike how many grams of carbs he had, or et cetera, et cetera. Pretty interesting, again. So you can just sort of tell from this that but depending on the day, uh, it really does change quite a lot. Uh, so you can see stage 19 is a very different situation because it's a high carb the whole day. Uh, six hours, 6,000 calories more or less. Two rockets, which uh, we'll get into later, and 14 Go Energy bars. Um, so yeah, he's having a big deficit on that day. Um, and this is also very interesting. Um, so we basically get to see Chris Froome talking to his coach, uh, so I'll just skim through this, basically. There's much more for the race to play out over the next two stages. Nothing is impossible. Anyone who cracks on the finestra could lose minutes, especially if isolated. Demilion and Yates look tired. Uh, it will be a very big stage if the race is on the, from the finestra. The finestra is a 1,600-meter gain, so maybe just over an hour of steep climbing. Then there's two hours to the um, finish. Um, the final climb should be around 24 minutes. Your objective should be to arrive at the bottom of this climb, able to deliver as close to your best 24 minute effort. Uh, given the altitude of 1,200 to 1,800 meters, this would be similar to the power you did on the Zonkalan. So for the Zonkalan, we actually have the power of 440 watts for 20... Oh my god, 440 watts for the Zonkalan. Uh, that's absolutely nuts. I mean, okay, his power meter might overread. So let's say, I think Team Sky said it reads maybe by... Uh, over Overread, sorry, by uh, 6%. So we'll just uh, divide that by 1.06, and that should get us the answer that we need. So maybe 415 watts up the Montezoncalan. It's pretty nuts, to be honest. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. Giving his weight about 68 kilos, that's uh, some big boys. Um, and then he says, morning, Caro. I'd like to try and make the finestra as selective as possible. I'm even trying to get away from the GC group on the gravel if people are on the ropes. I know it's a long way to the finish from there, and it would take a massive effort, but a TT from the finish there wouldn't be too different on the wheels or alone. Very little that isn't up or down. If I do get away and there's still two hours of racing left, I'm guessing it's a high... It, I, I pace as high SAP. I'm not 100% sure what SAP is. I might have a little, little Google here. Um, it must be something about aerobic power. Um, nah, nothing's really coming up. Okay, it must potentially be something like aerobic power. 420-ish went on the pedals, then have two descents to recover. Then he says, obviously it would be ideal to have someone work with you. Maybe Wout could do it. Um, and he'll be a little bit slower. He thinks one to two minutes slow on the final climb. Uh, and then he says... He can go ahead when it eases. So they're trying to get wild pools up the road, but that didn't work. But anyway, it's interesting to see the, you know, the powers that Chris Room can do, like at the end of a stage, 440 watts, big. Obviously, there's a little bit of change. And then we have the Giro Tele Halle staff. This is all just logistics. I don't really find that that interesting, to be honest. They're just saying where they're going to stand. Um, and now we have Chris Room going into even more detail uh, and Team Sky. This is really like, I don't know if other teams do this, but this is a classic Team Sky thing to do where they just really drill into the details. They're not really super spontaneous, but like you can tell they plan this. They're like, right, Chris Room's going to go for the break. How are we going to get the energy that we need? So you can see here, this is the energy expenditure and fueling plan. So they basically approximate more or less what wattage everyone is going to do. So we want him sufficiently well-fueled and hydrated to deliver close to his best 24-minute 24 24 effort on the final climb, 440 to 450 watts. Um, so that, again, is Tim Karras probably helping out. Uh, so you can see here, the first climb, they expect him to do about 350 watts, more or less. So they'll need 270 grams of carbs, and per 20 minutes, he'll need 60 grams of carbs per 20 minutes. So um, that's obviously impossible. He won't be able to digest that much. So we'll have to eat more. Um, have to eat more in transition time. So this transition time at 200 watts, this is when he'll be able to eat far more carbs. Um, and then on the Colorado de la Finestra, they predict about an hour at 400 watts, more or less. So then he'll need 331 grams of carbs, and that's impossible. 102 grams of carbs per 20 minutes. That's absolutely nuts. So again, that's not going to happen. But you can see these other times where it's 30, that's where Chris Rune needs to eat. But he also needs to be really ready before we, you even get to like those stages. So he needs to be fueled before. Then on the Sestri Air Climb, this is just a, you know, a little drag. So he just does 350, uh, 375 watts maybe. Then on the descent, 200 watts. And then on the final climb, 450 watts. Um, now, this is very interesting because I believe that this was actually slightly, this was a plan B 
before um, Chris Room said he's going to go on the breakaway. Because in reality, uh, it wasn't this wasn't the plan to main, get the bottom of the final climb with the main contenders. It was actually to break away. So this is not super interesting because it wasn't actually what happened. But it's still interesting just to see what sort of how they expect Chris Room to uh, fuel and how much. Uh, yeah, it's just insane. Like when you read this. Um, stage will start with a full gas, full tank of gas, so he needs to be like really carved up. He can't try and, you know, not start, you know, with a little bit less carbs, you know, weighs a little less and then eat it on the bike. He's got to be like fully carved up and then just try and eat as much as he can the whole stage and like he's going to be depleting glycogen the whole time. Um, so yeah, this is, so when it's like less than 200 watts, he really needs to eat a lot of food. Um, this is the bare minimum to prevent further depletion. So he needs to eat at least one piece of food every 20 minutes when it's below 200 watts. Obviously when he's going full gas, he's just got to drink as much water or like mix as he can. Um, probably have a carbohydrate mix and just try and get that down him as quickly as possible. All right, sorry about that. The old screen recording can only do 10 minutes at a time. So what does it show? They've broken in the section, worked out the average power. I don't think other teams are doing this. The next most important race to Froome was De Moulin. His team somewhere didn't do that. Anyway, this is the detail of um, what they wanted to do with Chris Froome. Uh, they just wanted to make sure that Chris Froome didn't have to like, carry a bottle the whole way up the climb. He didn't want to have two bottles. So it's like he'd literally drink the bottle as much as he can, throw it away, get the next bottle, drink it, throw it away every two kilometers. Now, this is, this is okay, I'll go through this and then we'll talk about rocket fuel, which is uh, <laughs> interesting. So anyway, this is their plan. So they would literally have someone with four bottles of water, um, four of the mix, I guess, and two gels per bottle. This is four of water, four of the mix. So X is, denotes mix and two gels per water plus wheels plus jackets. Then on the finestra, they literally have someone 98, four kilometers later, two kilometers later, two kilometers later, two kilometers later, two kilometers later. So Chris Room never had to carry a big bottle of water. He could just have a little quick sip, throw it away, have a little quick sip, throw it away. So then he was never having to carry such weight because you think 500 grams at this sort of level, it's like, that's, that's quite a lot of power that, you know, could be there. But you'll see that they underline rocket fuel. Now, a rocket fuel to me seems like a finishing bottle, which is normally a mix of painkillers, caffeine, and amphetamines. I think now they probably don't use amphetamines, but I wouldn't be surprised if it still has painkillers and things in them. Now, James Morton pretends, he's the Team Sky nutritionist, and he says this, and I just don't believe him at all. The real name for rocket fuel is beta fuel. It's... <laughs> It's a multiple source carbohydrate drink. It contains a mixture of maltodextrin and fructose. Um, this, most sports drink contain roughly to 20 to 40 grams of carbohydrate. This contains 80 grams. Yeah, plus loads of other shit like caffeine and things. Like, I don't, I don't buy it. It's just more carbohydrates because they could just make the other one more concentrated. Like, to be honest, it's obvious that there's something um, a bit, a little bit more in that. Uh, but anyway, still, nonetheless, it's good. Uh, so you can see here, that we have the analysis of Chris Room's performance. Now this is, I did a very similar video to this but based on Velon's data, but Velon, you know, they always try and hide the good stuff. Um, they always try and make pro cycling look a little less impressive than it really is because they don't want people to be as impressive. So anyway, so this is where it says, due to the use of osymmetric rings, Chris Room's power numbers overreport by approximately 6%. So, and he weighed about 69 kilos on the morning. So a little bit heavier than I thought. I thought he would have went 66, 67. Chris, I mean, Team Sky might be lying. I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, round his weight up a little bit just to, you know, make it not look too crazy. And the, the 6% thing, a lot of people say it's bullshit. When you actually look into the mathematics of the stages power meter, it's not like, they, they assume that the rotational velocity, so how fast it's going round, um, is constant uh, in order to calculate the power because they don't measure it, like they don't measure it the whole time. So like the rotor power meter, they measure it so frequently uh, that their queuings work. But with the stages power meter, these osymmetric rings, they don't work because at some points it's going faster, some points it's going slower. And stages did testing and they think it's about 6%. So more or less that. I'm just gonna go through the power data and then you can roughly, you know, 6% is not, it's not a crazy amount. I mean, the stages power meter is plus or minus 2%. So there's actually a decent amount of variance in this. Uh, so the start of the first climb just averaged 320 watts, just like tempo for Chris. <laughs> it's quite sad, but that is that is tempo for Chris. Uh, the transition, which is 52 minutes, that will include downhill. That's just like literally recovery pace for him, 213 watts. If you have a threshold of like 400, which he probably does, maybe a little bit more, then you think 50% of that, 55% is normally what recovery is. So it literally is like recovery pace for him, like active recovery. Um, then he has Colo de la Fenestra, which is 407 watts. That's a big boy. Um, it'll be a little less than that, but anyway, 400 watts is still, you know, high five, high five watts per kilo for an hour, which is very, very solid. 
Um, and you can see it's VAM here, 15.38, that's, yeah, that's good for an hour. Uh, but the first part of Fenestra is 40 minutes at 408 watts, um, which, you know, is, is good, but it's not crazy. His attack, only 16 seconds long, 603 watts. He spun that attack up. I remember him. His cadence, average cadence was 111, max 118. Um, and then he had the last 24 minutes of the Fenestra solo. So you can see actually it was harder at the beginning than the last part when he was on his own. Um, and you can see the VAM numbers here have decreased by potentially 40. Obviously, VAM is not the best way of measuring, um, but it's a good way to see the effect of teammates because obviously he's doing 407 watts on the wheel there, and he's doing 400 watts wheel, 401 watts, sorry, uh, on his own. So, you know, there is drafting on these climbs. Anything over, for me, about 15K an hour, I feel like you get a decent enough draft. Um, and obviously, the faster you go, the more draft you get. On the descent, he only averaged 181. Um, he put 38 seconds here, so this is how much time he put into Tom de Moulin. 38 seconds there, 50 seconds here, 23 seconds there, and on the descent, 45 seconds, transition, 40 seconds, and on the climb, on the last climb, he barely did anything. So you can see in the valley, he just averaged 300 watts, which for him is hard, but not nuts. Like, he averaged, you know, that's a good tempo for Chris, probably, 300 watts, and then he, what he wanted to do, I guess, is make sure that for the last 25-minute climb, he wasn't fucked. Like, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't completely cooked. And um, it's a good tactic by Chris. So then he averaged 392 watts. So he's only a minute slower than Tim Kerrison thought if he was completely fresh and was probably in the group. So I think maybe Tim Kerrison was a little bit uh, over, under optimistic. So I feel like if they were in a group, they would have done that in 23 minutes, probably because there's some drafting and everyone going a bit harder. But anyway, that's, that's where you can see Chris Froome gained the time. So he gained a lot of time on the descent. Uh, so these two descents alone, he gained one minute and 35 seconds. So that's... Uh, that's pretty good to be fair. Um, and then you can see in the transition, he gained 40 seconds. So again, that was because they were waiting for people. Riking back isn't that strong um, compared to Chris Froome when they're swapping turns. Thibaut Pino didn't do a single turn really, just put his teammate on the front. And maybe De Moulin wasn't feeling great either. Um, and then the Jalfaro climb, they climbed pretty much the same speed, um, more or less in two seconds is such an irrelevance. So anyway, again, it's very interesting to see Chris Froome's power data. I mean, it's like, I mean, they could have made this up, like, I, I, you don't know, but it seems right to me. It does seem not crazy. Uh, this is what I expect to see. Like, no, this is not going to be pushing 400 watts for the whole stage. It's not going to happen in the middle of a grand tour. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's nothing that would make you suspicious, but again, it's so hard to tell because the training stretch is so individual. Um, the problem is this data, it's very nice. I'm going to assume it's accurate. Again, it could not be. You need external data. You need to know, figure out the power of other riders. Um, but anyway, thanks Chris Froome, thanks Team Sky for posting that, looking into the details of what makes a Grand Tour rider, how Grand Tour riders have to restrict their calories because they don't eat good food, and also how Grand Tour riders have outrageous watts the whole time, like last last stage of the, of the um, what's it called, last couple of stages of the Giro d'Italia, and he's still banging out like 400 watts. I wonder where his normalizer was for that. Actually, you could probably calculate it to be fair. Um, I might I might do that and calculate what his normalized would it'll probably be like 350 or 360 normalized uh, for six hours <laughs> which is absolutely insane so anyway cheers for watching hope you enjoyed this video thanks Chris Froome thanks Team Sky will, Chris, will Team Sky and Chris Froome win the uh, Tour de France I think so because they know what they're doing as you can see from this they've got all the plans they know they probably already know how, like what wattage Chris Froome is going to ride on the cobbles and all the rest of it they probably know <laughs> No, the team time draw off by heart. They probably know they're going to win by like 30 seconds. But anyway, it's a great video. It's a pretty long one. So anyway, cheers for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.